let's look at another example of a test's significance um, and let's just jump into example number two but keep in mind that when we're working on a significance test we're always trying to uh, examine the claim about a population parameter always about mu and the goal is to assess to see is there evidence that it is not or lower than or higher than that value so example two from the notes say GMAT scores are used for admission to graduate management programs the mean score for test takers is mu is equal to 550 with a standard deviation of 110 so it's telling us you know in general uh, the average score on the GMAT is 550 uh, and if uh, we're assuming that it falls a normal distribution uh, given the uh, with the, with the standard deviation of 110 and knowing that information tells us a lot about the distribution the distribution of GMAT scores <coughs> excuse me sorry for my coughs um, a researcher in the Philippines is concerned about the performance of their undergraduate students and believes that this year's college students will have a mean less than 550 so here's the essence of the significance test. It's stated that in general, GMAT test takers have a given mu val, a given average test score. Um, but um, this researcher imagines that her uh, group of students within the Philippines actually does not have that average, and that's always the nature of a significance, a test of significance. Is there's some claim, like in the previous example, the claim was Professor Havens could bowl 70% strikes. Um, the evidence was different. The evidence said that that's probably not the case. And that's what we're going to be seeking to do again in this example is um, the claim is that the average of test takers is 550. We believe that the, Filipin uh, the Filipino students this year are will be less than that. So let's say that she obtained a random sample of 100 college seniors uh, within the Philippines who will be going into uh, graduate level management. Uh, and they uh, all take the GMAT. So obviously she's only gonna be testing students who are actually uh, taking the test legitimately because they desire to um, you know, go on to graduate level business. But in this case, the claim um, is that the average of the test takers is 550 uh, and we seek evidence against that claim. And that's actually what's referred to as the null hypothesis. Usually it's written, let me move over to um, the notes for sex so we can take this but I'm just gonna write this for now I'm gonna talk a little bit about what it means a little bit later but I'm right h sub 0 colon mu is equal to 550 and this is the assumption in the um, the, the claim about the population at hand um, and she thinks the I'm, I'm gonna write this as well and talk about a little bit more about what this means a little bit later uh, the researcher thinks that the actual average of Filipino test takers is less than 550 um, and so again I'm writing this with an inequality uh, and, this, and usually the thing that we're trying to actually figure out in these questions is what's called the alternative hypothesis not the null hypothesis and this is something that's confusing and if you're like if you're thinking Professor Abrams what are you talking about well we'll talk about this in a little bit later but the the, the essence of a test of significance is always examining these two situations so we want to know which which is the case is it 550 or is it less than 550 um, now, in, if we're looking at evidence against the claim, we can always draw the density curve of the given situation because we know our sample size, we know the standard deviation, and we know the mean. And just like we did in chapter 16, we know how a sampling distribution will look as the standard deviation will be reduced by the sample size. So let me go back to the notes and I'll go ahead and write that. So the standard deviation of the sampling distribution is the original standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of the sample size. So since we have a sample of size 100, that will reduce our standard deviation by a factor of 10 because square root of 100 is 10. So I'm going to get 110 divided by 10, which is, of course, 11. But basically, uh, when I take a sample of students within the Philippines, I know that they're uh, standard deviation of the sample mean should be uh, roughly 11 and that will tell me the probability that I get an, a sample that is much much higher or much much lower than the true established mean 550 and so for writing the distribution we always operate under the assumption that the null hypothesis is true meaning that the claim that the actual average of those GMAT test takers was 550 we're just going to assume that's true um, for all the math that we do and then from there, we're going to then check on how likely is it that if we get a different result, it will be significantly different. On uh, the term st significantly different, again, that's what we call statistical significance. 
uh, we'll get we'll keep talking about that idea later. But remember, the mean of the distribution should match the claim because we're assuming that's true. And the standard deviation of our sampling distribution will be 11. And so if we're thinking about the, you know, by standard deviation, well, if I add one standard deviation to the left, that'd be 561. Adding another standard deviation of 11 would be 572 and so on. We could get a good sense of what our sampling distribution looks like. And if I subtract 11, that would be 539 and 528 and 517. And the probability of laying anywhere in this distribution, we know by the rule, the 60, uh, 6899, um, sorry, 6895, 99.7 rule. Or again, we know we could always find a z-score to figure out the probability of something being in a particular position. But if we look at the next couple examples on the next page of our lecture notes, it says, well, imagine the researcher obtained a sample mean X bar, uh, X1 bar of 539 or X2 bar of 528. Mark these on the sketch and we'll determine the likelihood of those. So, uh, so in, this, in this assumption, the researcher, she was assuming, <coughs> excuse me, that uh, her students from the Philippines had an actual lower average than 550, that this was not correct, that it was somewhere below. And so in order to test to see if the average was less, she actually gathered data. And let's say she took two different samples and got the first sample of her students was 539, the second student was 528. And a classic mistake with test's significance is notice that these two means are less than the stated average of 550. But it would be a mistake to just say that these give us evidence that it's lower just because obviously our sample is lower. But remember, these samples are randomized. Just because we obtain one or two samples that are lower than the stated average doesn't is not evidence. Uh, and also, basically, how different it is from the actual value plays into that. And that's why we actually need to do the math. We can't just say, yeah, their average of her students was less because this is a sample of 100 students. This is not all of the students in the Philippines. And, you know, again, we can't assume that our sample is completely right. That would be... A mathematical mistake but anyways if we're, if we're marking these on our distribution you know x1 bar would be right here so let's say she took one sample of 100 students those 100 students had a, a, an average mean gmat score of 539 and the second sample was even worse x2 bar well the the smaller sample size would be stronger evidence that the claim is not true and that the alternative hypothesis is true the first the first set of data would be less evidence <clears throat> and my point is that we can actually determine the probability uh, of the test by doing the normal distribution math. Because if, if we break it down based on the categories, remember 68% of the data is in here, uh, 95 is in here. And if you remember this, basically 13.5% of, of the scores would be here and 2.5% of the scores um, would be here. <clears throat> and those were just numbers that we looked at uh, back when we were doing chapter three. And cumulatively, basically, we have approximately a 16% chance, and we could, again, do the math to get a more accurate calculation from here. Um, but so if we look at the final question of this example, it says, explain why the first result is not good evidence that the claim is false and why the second is. Well, in the first case, let me go ahead and write out what I'm saying, is there's approximately a 16% chance that uh, even if... Uh, mu 550 were true, we would obtain a sample of at most 539 or uh, that that's that's good enough. So let me try to explain this in a different way if that's not making sense. But basically, based on the normal distribution calculations, even if the actual population had a mean of 550, the sample will vary. There's variance within the sample because uh, it's a random sample. Uh, and the standard deviation tells us, well, how much variance will a sample have? Uh, and so, you know, based, you know, since 539 is only one standard deviation below the true assumed value of the population, uh, that's not super far away from the average. And it's not that unlikely that we'd obtain a value this low. And the actual likelihood of obtaining that value of a mean or lower is around 16% of the time. 
And so essentially, let's say that the researcher took this as evidence that her her students uh, in the Philippines have a lower uh, average than 550. Well, 16% of the time, that would just happen naturally by random variance. And it's, it's up to you to decide, well, is that strong evidence or not? But essentially, you know, let's just say that's 20%, one time out of five, that even if it were true that the average test score of her students were 550, she still would obtain that lower score relatively often, right? 16% is, is not a high percentage, but it's not super strong evidence, if you see what I mean, because just random variants will attribute that lower score of 539 16% of the time. And generally, we'd say that that's not strong enough evidence. Now, this in the second case, notice that if she obtained a sample mean of 528 from her 100 students, that's a different story because that's a lot further away from the stated mean of the population. And there's only about a 2.5% chance. So let's go ahead and write that out. There's about a 2.5% chance um, of essentially the same thing happening. So I'm just going to write that um, uh, to obtain a sample of at most... 528 um, and you know all the same conclusions can be made where you know roughly 2.5 percent of the time she would actually get this low of a sample that is strong evidence however and note note the difference that um, you know very very rarely would you obtain that low of a score and a lower p-value is stronger evidence against the claim because again this is the claim use 550 this is a little bit different from the mean um, and cal and so we call this the p-value of a test's significance. Um, and there's also uh, sort of like in a, signif um, a confidence interval, there's the confidence level. There's a significance level of a test's significance, which is essentially the same thing. We're going to get to all these terms in just in the next video because I want to wrap this all up in a minute. Um, but these are all leading us into the ideas of what we call the null and alternative hypothesis, whether a test is one-sided or two-sided, calculating what's called a test significance and a p-value. Basically, in this example, we've done all of that without introducing the terminology. So again, my goal was just to talk about the idea of how these things work. Uh, let's get into kind of the nitty-gritty details in the next video, though.